on this great and amazing day. Everything that's important in the Orthodox Christian life can be learned from the crucifixion. I've heard it once said that the cross is the great curriculum and is the eternal lesson for all Orthodox Christians. The cross teaches us everything that is worthwhile and the lessons never end. I once heard it said like this, it is the fruit that never goes bad, the salt that never loses its flavor, the light that never burns out. The cross can teach us everything because it directs our eyes and our minds to the image of the God-man, Jesus Christ. Sometimes, unfortunately, we find petty things to complain about on a daily basis. We grumble about the way that we are treated when, in fact, if we took a step back, we would understand that we're generally treated quite well. And if we think about it and we compare it to our Lord Jesus Christ, it wasn't enough that our Lord had to flee from his own people as an infant. And this madness would continue even when he was a grown man. It wasn't enough that he taught the people about the ways of the kingdom of heaven. It wasn't enough that he preached and forgave their sins. It wasn't enough that he healed the blind and he raised the dead. What was his thanks? What do the people offer him to show gratitude? What do we offer him to show our gratitude? The one that showed the way, the way to salvation. The Jews thanked him. I thanked him with a cross. They offered it as a punishment. But our Lord returns it as a free gift. It reminds us this reversal that happens. It reminds us of the Garden of Eden. Satan offered the fruit as a free gift. And after tasting the fruit, Adam and Eve found it to be a punishment. The tree in the garden, it led to death, while the tree of Golgotha leads to life. God warned Adam and Eve. He said, avoid the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because it would lead to death. This is something he was very clear about. Yet even today, God compels us to draw near the cross, the tree of the cross, which is the fountain of life. You see, where God warned our ancestors not to taste of the fruit of the tree, he begs us to taste of the cup of salvation offered to us by his son on the cross. Adam was offered beauty. Christ was offered a terrible cup. Satan offered a beautiful lie to Adam and Eve. He promised them that you would receive the world if they would just simply disobey God. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they realized they were left empty-handed, desolate. Yet, our Lord offers something that, at first glance, it seems like something that's not beautiful at all. Isaiah says in chapter 52, He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted, as many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance, and his own form beyond that of which of the children of mankind. In other words, it's a fancy way of saying that the Lord on the cross was a very difficult sight to behold. God offers us his son who bore the stripes and the wounds for our sins. And in his desolation on the cross, our Lord offers us a chance to return as children of the Most High God. It's an amazing gift. You see, today on Friday, something incomprehensible happens we reflect on an amazing reversal that happens. You see, in first century Israel, in the first century Rome, the cross, the cross was not a fashion statement. It was not a decoration for your car or for your houses. 
Whenever somebody saw the wooden cross, they would instantly have flashbacks of the hundred and decaying, rotten corpses that they had seen, maybe for days. They would see on the side of the road, just warning you and showing you what would happen if you dared cross the Roman government, if you dared not to worship their gods, if you dared not to bow the knee to the Roman emperor. This was a threat. Not just decaying corpses, but sometimes people would, unfortunately, be conscious and and they would be tortured for many days. They didn't always die within a few hours on the cross. Sometimes it would take them as much as a week. I'm sorry to be so graphic. But every time that you see the cross, in this time, you would think of murder. You would think of death. You would think of a stench. You would think of torture. You get this sickness in the pit of your stomach every time you see this ugly cross. This filthy cross. This cross that's a sign of Roman domination. It's a cross that's a sign of death. It's a sign of mortality. It's a sign of the power of evil. The cross was not a necklace. It was not a tattoo. It was not jewelry. It was not a sticker or a shirt. It was a sign of absolute power of the Roman government. It was a sign of human torture. It was a sign of fear and death. Everything bad that you can think of was associated with with the image of the cross. Some people expected earlier this week that a powerful conquering Messiah would come in just like every other conqueror before him, only better this time. He would kill his enemies. He would rule from on high. He would take over the empire. But that would just be too easy. It's something everybody would recognize. That would be God adopting the ways of the world. But his ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. As Isaiah writes, even as the heavens are above the earth, so his ways and his thoughts are above ours. And so God did not defeat death and suffering by coming in and riding on a white stallion, conquering the empire. No, he defeats death by death, trampling down death by death and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. He embraced the very symbol of wickedness. And it becomes something so beautiful that we kiss it. We revere it. We honor it. We wear it as a necklace close to our hearts. We define ourselves by it. He took what the world said is shameful and he exalted it. And he used it for the salvation of mankind. Now, to do something like that requires the power of God, this great reversal. And he does it over and over. He does it in my life. He does it in your life. Over and over, this great reversal that happens. You see, in our worldly ways of thinking, sometimes we just want to go into a time machine And we want to go back and undo that embarrassing thing of our past. That horrible thing that we committed some time ago. That injustice that we suffered. If we could just go back and undo that thing. No, but God doesn't give us a time machine. He gives us a cross. The same cross that he bore, he gives to each one of us to bear. He invites us to walk the same way that he walked to Golgotha. To strip off everything that's proud. To take off all of our pride. To humble ourselves before him and our brothers. To carry the cross of affliction and suffering on our backs. And just at the moment when the world thinks it's won, just the moment that 
the world thinks it's defeated us, it's the moment that we triumph. But this is hard of one This is why St. Paul said, clearly, the message of the cross is foolishness to the world. And yet, for serious Christians, this is the wisdom of God. We discover divine wisdom and a deeper meaning of self-sacrifice and self-denial. A life of self-denial, a life of sacrifice, it brings great joy and it brings great discovery. The church teaches us that the more that we deny ourselves, the more that we give away of ourselves, the, it's the more that we receive. When we learn to carry our cross and to die to our egocentric ways, we will discover the purpose of life. It's not found in a book. Ultimately, the cross reminds me that life is not about me. God does not exist to, to fulfill my needs like some genie, like a vending machine like was mentioned last night. We were not created with a, a different purpose. We were created with a purpose to seek out God, to discover ways that lead us to a deeper union with him and the world around us. Union and communion with God demand a life of self-sacrifice and dedication to loving and serving others. This is the way of the cross. And it's fascinating to me when we reflect during this time to think that our Lord Jesus Christ attracted his disciples and followers with this message. He didn't make false promises of prosperity and comfort. No, he brutally told the truth in his demands, his commands. If you follow me, you have to forgive others, even when they don't, they don't deserve it. If you follow me, you have to love your enemies, even the most difficult ones. If you follow me, you have to live a life of the cross. It's a command. Of course, we find comfort knowing that the resurrection follows the cross. And this journey of sacrifice will ultimately lead us to the reign of God, into experiencing a kingdom of God here and now. This type of life will dis help us discover a peace that passes all understanding and, and an imaginable joy. Christ promises us that he will be with us forever, that he will never abandon us in this life and in the next. He will help us carry whatever burdens that weigh us down, and he will give us rest. He will reveal to us the secrets of paradise and fill our lives with the deepest meaning and purpose. He will help us live a life that was originally meant to be, a life that's full of divine love, knowing that we are loved by our Creator with unconditional love. And we are called to share that same love to the world around us. Becoming a disciple of Christ, it is not walking the wide and easy path that most people walk in this life. No. To walk intimately with Christ, it means to walk the other-centered life, not the self-centered one. It means to walk a life that is seeking out the kingdom of God, not seeking out the kingdom of this world. It means denying some of our pleasures and passions and our desires in order to replace them with something that's eternal and meaningful. Sometimes we don't always get what we want. It means accepting whatever cross God allows us in our lives and bear that cross with faith, with perseverance, with hope and love. Always remembering that through this particular cross that God has crafted for me, that we may discover God's power in a new way and may offer a unique witness 
to his love to the world that surround us. If we step back and examine our own lives, oftentimes, I'm speaking for myself, that we run towards sin. And we run away, we run away from the crosses. They're uncomfortable. It's easier and more comfortable to run to sin. We have been like Adam, the disobedient, the faithless son of God. The Lord Jesus says, be imitators of me. He is the obedient and faithful son who ran in the direction of the cross when everybody else would naturally run in the other direction. Where Adam ran towards what was best for himself, our Lord runs towards the thing that would be the worst of all. Where Adam ran and he cursed mankind, our Lord runs towards the cross with each person in mind. That is the love that God has for mankind. In, in different religions of the world, sacrifices are brought to appease the gods. In Christ crucified, we see the final and perfect sacrifice offered by God himself on behalf of all for all. The instrument of death becoming the ladder to eternal life. In the garden, Adam, by his rebellion, he spread disease and sickness all over the creation. But by the cross, Christ, through his faithfulness, heals and restores the order of the universe. In the garden, Adam, he was cursed through his selfish act. On the cross, Christ became a curse to remove the curse of Adam for us. In the garden, Adam tasted the bitterness of death. By the cross, Christ made death itself taste bitterness. Today, and for the rest of our days, we're given a choice. Do we imitate the first Adam or the second Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ? Do we continue to be children of flesh who rebel against God, or do we, come, do we become children of the Spirit, part of the family of God? Do we allow pride to divide us, to divide us from one another, from our families, or do we humbly submit to one another as our Lord has done for us and given us the perfect example? Just some concluding thoughts. On, on Great and Holy Friday, the Orthodox Church commemorates the sufferings of Christ, the mockery, the crown of thorns, the scourging, the nails, the thirst, the vinegar and the gall, the cry of desolation, and all the things that our Savior endured on the cross. On Great and Holy Friday, we encounter Christ our Lord as our servant, bearing our abuses and carrying out all the work needed for our salvation. And he humbles himself to serve us and to save us. On Great and Holy Friday, we stand in awe of the God of humility, the God whose sufferings and love knows no bounds. I'm going to leave you with a quote from St. Augustine, reminding us of his great love for us. He says, As the women were looking on, so we too gaze at his wounds as he hangs. We see his blood as he dies. We see the price offered by the Redeemer. We touch the scars of his resurrection. He bows his head as if to kiss you. His heart is bare to open, as it were, in love to you. His arms are extended that he may embrace you. His whole body is displayed for your redemption. Ponder how great these things are. Let all this be richly weighed in your mind. As he was once fixed to the cross in every part of his body, for you, so he may now be fixed 
in every part of your soul. May we run to his cross daily and receive power and healing and mercy and freedom and love from the one who is love. May we run to the cross and find the true paradise and glory be to God forever. Amen.